Hi everyone, so in this video we're going to talk about so-called interatomic potentials and how they can describe some rather interesting things about atoms. For example, let's say we have an atom here uh, and another one over here. Uh, and, well, let's say we have a whole series of atoms. What decides how closely they are spaced? Well, if we have, let's say, positive and negatively charged atoms that are bonded together, you might imagine that you'd start out with a positive fellow over here and a negative fellow over here, and there would be an attractive force, not just any attractive force, but a Coulombic attractive force, which we could write as k over uh, k times q1 q2 and then r squared where the force of attraction is related to that distance r and then q1 would be the charge over here and then q2 would be say the charge on this guy uh, but why don't these guys end up overlapping like this and having some very small distance why why might it look like this? Why not some other distance? What limits them from collapsing all together and forming one bigger atom all by itself? Well, part of the reason, let's erase the chalkboard, is that as these two atoms come closer together, uh, those uh, charges that make them a cation and an anion are related to the sum of all the charges. So we have a nucleus here with a bunch of protons, nucleus here with protons, neutrons as well. We don't care about those because those don't contribute to the charge. But on the outside of this atom, uh, the way we're drawing the circle here, uh, we have electrons moving around. So we have these electron shells. We'll just assume they look like S-like orbitals. They have kind of a spherical geometry. So as those atoms get closer, let's just look at the electron shells. If they overlap too much, then there's a negative, negative repulsion. So there's a repulsive force uh, that's going to push those atoms apart. And so there's eventually going to be some balance, some equilibrium uh, distance where the atoms are just the right distance apart, where if they're further apart <clears throat> than some given distance, let's say RE is the equilibrium distance. So this, uh, this total distance is R. And then we could draw the same, another value, a different R at some other value. E would be the equilibrium distance where the forces are balanced. So this is the equilibrium distance where the attractive and repulsive forces are equal to one another. So they are balanced. So how could we model that? Well, it ends up in doing that kind of modeling. We can not only have a way of describing so-called interatomic distances, but we can also explain things like thermal expansion, as we'll show in a moment. Let's back up and do a little bit of physics. We can talk about a potential energy. Let's call it U, and that potential energy of some system might be equal to minus M, and let's say it's <clears throat> Q1, Q2 divided by some distance R. So this would represent a form of potential energy, in this case, an electrical potential. The force would be du dr. Actually, it's the negative of the, um, of the derivative. Well, let's keep that positive here, and we'll write this here. You'll see this formulated uh, where the force is the negative derivative of some potential energy term uh, divided um, by distance, uh, or taken as a derivative with respect to distance. And the reason why that is you can think of work. Work is a form of energy. It has units of energy. Work is equal to force times distance. So even though these really aren't algebraic units, you can think of this if we uh, uh, separate the, the parts. We have FDR, not the president, uh, F times some change in distance here written as R as an interatomic distance is equal to du, so this is a change in potential energy. Well, any work um, that's going to be done by this system is going to decrease the potential energy, and so that's why we have that negative sign there. You can also do the derivative with respect to time, and that instead of force would be power. So power 
would be the derivative with respect to time. And that would also be negative. Any power you would get would be related to a decrease in the potential energy. But in this case, we're looking at a potential energy with respect to time, whereas with forces, we're looking at uh, uh, differences in potential energy, a type of work, when the change is with respect to distance. All right, so let's come back to this equation here. I've written it in this particular format for a reason. So if we have potential energy written like this, uh, let's take the first derivative. Uh, we can erase the chalkboard. So if <clears throat> u is m1, q1, q2 divided by r, then du dr, that would be our force, is equal to minus m q1 q2 divided by r squared. Uh, change the m instead of a so-called Madelon constant, make it k for Boltzmann's constant, and that force will be familiar. That is the Coulombic force. So you can think of the Coulombic force as the first derivative of an electric potential where we have in the numerator two charges, uh, and then if uh, we wanted to calculate the force, it's not just the uh, magnitude of the charges, but there's a value e squared here uh, that relates to the magnitude of the charge on an electron. So this is uh, charge on an electron. Uh, and that would give you the force in, um, in Coulombs. So now let's take a look at how we're going to apply this to look at interatomic potentials. There's a fellow by the name of Born who came up with the so-called Born potential. And again, when we say potential, that's just a shorthand for potential energy, and in this case it is electrical potential energy. So what did Born do? He looked at energy as being a sum of a, uh, uh, an energy that would allow things to be attracted to one another. So that would be a negative energy, and we would have A over R, and then there would be a repulsive B over R to the N. And in most cases, that Born exponent would be 9, but it doesn't have to be exactly 9. You'll see values that range from... 5 to 12. Sometimes you'll see fractional values of 9.1. So this exponent here can be a lot of things. But take a look at this total potential energy now. So when we talk about the Coulombic force, remember it with this A here, uh, we're just collapsing the M times Q1, Q2 part into a single quantity A. So that's the numerator here. If we differentiate just that, we'd get the Coulombic attractive force. That's for two atoms that are very far apart. So we have a positive and a negative, and then it will be attracted to one another. But when they get close, then there is a repulsive potential energy, and that's described here. This is getting a little messy, so let's rewrite. So the Born potential would be minus A over R, uh, plus b over r to the n, and a common value is 9, so we'll just put that there. So this here is the uh, Coulombic force. So the Coulombic, it's not really the force, we'd have to differentiate the force, so we'll call it the Coulombic potential. And this is the repulsive part of the, the potential, the thing that causes the atoms to be pushed away when they get too close to one another, when those electron orbitals begin to overlap. So it's the sum of those two things. And if we now chart what that looks like, we can plot, let's say, U on the vertical axis, where it is increasing in this direction, and then we have R in this direction. The sum of those two curves would give you something that looks something like that, give you a curve that looks like this, very steep uh, when R is very small and the atoms are very close, uh, and then it kind of flattens out a bit and it has this pronounced minimum. So what does all this mean? Remember that force is equal to du dr. Take the negative of that, negative of that as we should, uh, but notice that the force will switch signs we get the negative of a negative uh, slope here, so that would be a positive force. It would be a repulsive, so that would push things away. 
And then over here, we would get a positive slope, so that would be a negative force that would cause the uh, atoms to attract and for R to decrease. Uh, and then notice as we come towards this minimum here, those slopes begin to flatten out, so those forces are less and less. And at this value here, the slope is zero. And where the slope is zero, the force is zero. And that is where we would have R zero. That would be the equilibrium value, the equilibrium distance between two atoms. So how close or how far would two atoms get when the forces are in balance? They would have an equilibrium distance of R naught when they've stopped, when the forces are balanced. They've stopped coming towards or being pushed away from you, one another. So uh, why is this important? Well, we can use these kinds of models, things that are much more sophisticated than the Born potential, to try to explain interatomic potentials. So you might have heard about so-called um, uh, molecular orbital models. Um, there, there are various quantitative models where you can uh, play some games where you can think of a bunch of atoms as billiard balls and then predict, about, predict how they would interact. And we could predict the forces of interactions by using these kinds of potentials in a more complex way. Because if we have more than two atoms, now we have many more interactions between the various fellows. But here's another thing. If this is an equilibrium distance, think of temperature as being a way to increase energy. So if you have very cold temperatures, you would have some equilibrium distance here. But as this atom uh, increases in temperature, so let's have a very high temperature where the average distance um, would now be the vibrations that would be bracketed by that curve, notice that the average distance would actually be shifted to some value that is greater than the R naught. So as things get heated up, this would follow something of a curve, not a straight line, the equilibrium distance between the repulsive forces here and the attractive forces here, that midway point, would be shifted out to larger and larger values of R. So this is a way that we can explain so-called thermal expansion. So how can we know whether or not we have a good uh, formulation for the potential, uh, the total potential energy between two atoms? Well, we get to see if it describes the thermal expansion coefficient of a given material. And there are other kinds of equations. We said earlier that we could have uh, let's say u is equal to minus a over r plus b over r to the n, where n is often 9. But it could be a different exponent like 5 or 12 or 9.1 might satisfy an, exp a, an observed value for the thermal co coefficient of expansion uh, for some other kind of material. There are also different kinds of potential. So there's, for example, the Leonard-Jones potential which is used for modeling metals and some gases. In the Leonard-Jones potential, uh, we would have u is equal to minus a over r to the 6 plus b over r to the 12th. And again, a and b can be related to some kinds of uh, 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 physical constants and things like the charges on the respective cations and anions that are interacting with one another. So there are a lot of different potentials, a lot of different kinds of interatomic potentials. We've just shown you two, the Born model, which we've been working with up to now, and this is the Leonard-Jones formulation. Uh, in general, most of these are designed so that if you look at u, u versus r, you get a curve that looks something like this, where you have an equilibrium value here. Uh, my recommendation to all of you is to try to plot this up yourself. Uh, let's, uh, let A be equal to 200, and let B be about 150, just to pick not completely arbitrary values. If you let them have these values and then plot up this kind of an equation in an Excel spreadsheet, uh, then you can derive and you can plot out this equation and see the shape of it. And then you can play with these constants and with things like the, the n values here and see how those affect the shape. That, that's kind of a fun thing to do. The way you would do that is you would simply uh, pick a bunch of r values and let them go from 0 to, I don't know, 5. 
uh, let it be angstroms, and then you pick the value, uh, you pick the model that you want, you can pick the Born potential, or you can pick a uh, Leonard Jones potential, you can plot both of them, and then plot up the total energies as these go from one to five in some, uh, some given units. So this would be your X, that would be your Y, that would be another Y. And so it's a really good exercise to calculate these, plot them up, and see if you can rec recreate those curves and take a look at um, how the various constants might affect their shape and what kind of predictions we would make for things like thermal expansion or how strongly uh, atoms might be attracted or repulsed for one another.